Wow, what a great crowd today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the Wingate Museum of Art. Uh, we're delighted that you're here. Uh, the Delita Martin exhibition and three other shows are next door. Uh, we're open from 12 to 5, Tuesday through Saturday. And the exhibitions will be up until March 18th. I'm Mary Kennedy, I'm the director of the museum here, and we are delighted to have Delita Martin in our midst. She's been in residence all week with us, and so many of you have met her in classes and in various activities. We just raced over here from having done a podcast, so you can find that on our website and learn more about Delita um, through that. But I'm here to provide the introduction for Delita before her talk. Um, Delita was born in Conroe, Texas and earned her BFA in drawing from Texas Southern University and her MFA in printmaking from Purdue University. She was formerly a member of the visual arts faculty at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, but left with the support of her husband to create her own studio, Black Box Press Studio, and create art full time. She lives and works in Huffman, Texas near Houston in a studio that can only be described as a printmaker's dream. Her work has been shown in the Havana Biennial and Art Basel Miami, and it is found in the permanent collections of the Minneapolis Institute of Art, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Georgetown University Art Collection, among others. Her international schedule of activity has increased, and we are so lucky to have her here with us this week for a residency. Thank you, Delita, for being with us, and let's give her a warm Hendrix welcome. Thank you so much for coming to uh, listen to me chat about art. I could talk shop all day. Um, first, I would like to thank Hendrix and all of the faculty and staff who invited me here. This has been a wonderful, incredible week. Um, not only did I get to visit with your students, I got to visit with some of my wonderful friends, lifelong friends um, from Euler. And um, I'm just happy to be here and be able to share Conjure with you. So um, just to kind of talk about my background a little bit, um, I, like Mary was saying, I have a BFA in drawing, and um, I had never made prints in undergraduate school. Uh, we had a printmaking department, however, we never had enough students to make the class. So it was just kind of one of those rooms that you just kind of walked by, passed by, and um, one day I happened to go into the art building to pick up a sketch pad that I left and I see the room is open, and Dr. John T. Biggers, who founded our art department and later went on to Hampton University to um, help them establish their art department there, was reopening an edition that he had created in like 1967. So my teacher, who was his mentee, Harvey L. Johnson, and uh, Charles Kreiner, who also studied with Dr. Biggers, and Early Hutnall, who was a photographer, um, in Houston, he just recently retired. He was photographing, um, Harvey was wiping the stone, and Kreiner was rolling the stone, and Dr. Biggers was signing. And he was ill at the time, so he was sitting there in his bathrobe and um, slippers. And I walk in the room, and I very quietly kind of sat in the corner, and I'm looking, and I'm like, what in the world is this magical dance that they're doing? There's chemicals all over the place. Um, I had no idea what they were, but there was this beautiful, sensitive, delicate drawing that was being created on this stone using all of this complicated chemistry that I had no idea about. So note to self, I'm gonna do that one day, have no idea when. And eventually I graduated and, um, eventually I graduated, and I decided that I wanted to go to graduate school, but I was going to study printmaking. Had no idea what I was doing. So I get in the school. All of I was probably the oldest student that was in the class. Everybody had a BFA in printmaking except for me. And I was that one person that was like raising hand. And everybody's like, oh, God, here she goes again. But I sat in undergraduate classes during the day and did my work at night for the first year of graduate school. 
And it took me probably a year and a half, maybe about a year and a half, to figure out how to translate drawing into printmaking. And it was very, very frustrating at the time because I couldn't figure it out. So um, I went on, and um, some of those prints are actually here on campus that I made, which was the first um, prints that I ever created in my life. And so it was really a treat to be able to see those, to look back on those prints this morning when I went to the office. But um, we're going to fast forward to today, or at least during the pandemic. I created a body of work called Conjure. And you know, the pandemic really changed everybody's life. Um, you know, we couldn't go anywhere. Everyone was stuck in their home, stuck in the studio. And so I was like, you know what? Let me make a body of work that is beyond myself, that's beyond anything that I have ever been able to create. And I asked myself the question, how do you make something larger than yourself? How do you make something beyond yourself? And I'm holding this conversation with a friend of mine, and she says to me, sometimes the spirits won't come unless you call them. And so that's what I spent a year and a half, two years in my studio doing was calling the spirits. And I was able to um, create a body of work that I called Conjure. And I called it Conjure because what I was doing, the women that I worked with um, in creating this body of work, we developed a relationship. These are women I've never met, women from around the country, um, women in other countries. We FaceTimed, we IG chatted, we um, talked on Instagram, Zoomed, all of that to be able for me to create this work. But we also created relationships. We created a sisterhood where we talked about spirituality. We talked about our journeys. We talked about you know, what our art meant to us. All of us created art in different ways. And so I kind of told them about my project, but I very loosely was like, hey, will you pose for me? You know, what do you look like when you meditate? What do you look like when you pray? And so, um, Pictures began to come in, you know, snapshots through the phone, or I would screenshot something when I was talking to them without them knowing, sometimes with them knowing. So this is one of the pieces. Um, this piece is called Trinity. And the young lady that is um, looking over her shoulder, her name is, yes. So um, her name is Ebony, and she, Ebony has modeled for me before. And I literally sent her a text message and said, hey, Ebony, um, would you care to model for me for a new series? And she was like, sure. And she and I, like I said, we've talked about um, our spiritual journeys and, you know, things that happen in life. And the other two figures are my nieces. And um, they've come into the studio and worked with me quite often as well. So I'm going to kind of walk you through how I created this piece. So when I first started out making work, I was like 22 by 30. And that was small for me. But when I left school, I wanted to challenge myself. When I decided to go into the studio full time, I was like, how do I um, challenge myself in terms of size? I wanted to challenge myself in terms of content and context of the work. And I also wanted to challenge myself in how I created the work. So this will give you an idea of scale. And so that's me, in case you hadn't guessed, um, working on the piece Trinity. And so typically when I start a piece, um, I like to work as intuitively as possible. So I come in with a generalized idea. So it could be a color, it could be a figure, it could be um, a visual vocabulary or a symbol that I use. And that's as far as I go. Because I like to leave myself open for the women that I create, for the work that I create to work through me. And I don't like to um, guide it, I like the work to guide me. And so in this particular piece, I was um, blue. You'll find, I'll talk about that a little bit more in terms of color. But um, it's a spiritual color for me, and that was 
the um, basis for this piece was creating, um, was using the color blue with this figure. This is a piece called Resting Place. And um, this young lady is actually a photographer. She became a really good friend of mine. Um, her name is Toki Rome Taylor. And uh, she's an incredible artist in her own right. And we talk quite often. She's actually photographed me before as well. But she is an incredible mother, an incredible wife, and it just shows through. And so she sent me this casual picture of herself. I told her I wanted to include her in the series. And um, I wanted to talk about her as a mother. And her skirt is part of the universe. And when you think about giving birth and nurturing children and nurturing mankind, that became a symbol for me to use in that way. And the pillows represent comfort and represent nurturing. And this piece is also in the exhibition as well. So one of the things that when I talk to the women, you know, sometimes I would offer suggestions as ter in terms of poses, but it was really important to me that um, the women not um, feel posed or have to pose in a certain way. So I would say, well, how do you, how do you meditate? How do you relax? Or, you know, if, if you were wanted to talk or express a certain feeling, what would you look like doing that? And I allowed them to do the posing because I was interested in them coming through in the work. And I didn't want it to seem uh, stiff or impersonal. And so I explained to them also that when I'm working with portraiture, I don't, I, I'm not a hyper-realist artist, and I'm not interested in the portrait looking exactly like the person, but what I am interested in is capturing your spirit. I'm interested in that twinkle in your eye. I'm interested in that tilt of your head, that very subtle gesture that makes you you. Those are, that's the information that I want to bring through in the work, and that's why it's important for me to have conversations with the women that I work with um, in that pose with me. Now, prior to working with models, I was working from the basis of memory, the idea that we as women come from one mother, the great mother icon. And so you would see my mother's eyes, you would see my grandmother's hands, you would see the lady down the street, you would see all these women who had a hand in raising me, women who had touched me in some shape, form, or fashion. And so all of these women were compiled in a single image. And then I became curious, um, and I think it really happened when I moved back to Houston. And I started thinking about what would it be like to have women that I know exist in the veilscape or exist and interact with the spirits or the ancestors that I talk about in my work. And that's when I began to ask um, people to pose for me. It started off as family, and then I had to kind of reevaluate what family meant. And so other um, women began to be a part of, of that. Among Shadows is a self-portrait. So um, during the pandemic, uh, my mother was in an accident and uh, she was in the hospital for many, many months. Um, it was, you know, eventually COVID caught up and um, she's no longer with us because of that. And I felt this overwhelming need to make self-portraits because I couldn't see myself. And that's the only way that I could describe it is that I couldn't see myself, I couldn't see where I was, and I had to realize that my mirror was broken. And so I had to figure out how I could get back to the beginning to be able to center myself. And so portraits did that for me. Portraits, because there's this intimacy that happens when you draw someone and so with that in mind, I began to draw myself and I began to understand where I was. And I'm still creating those portraits today. Um, 
it was just such a very difficult time. And in this particular piece, you can see that I am with two shadow figures. And those shadow figures are my ancestors. They're in the spirit world. And they're nurturing me. And they're taking care of me. And you see the three jars that, that are in the piece as well. And those are part of what I call my visual vocabulary. So a lot of my work has domestic objects for the most part. There's, there's the bird, there's um, the frying pan, there's pots, there's jars, and all of those have a particular meaning for me. And in this particular case, it talks about the illusion of freedom, the idea that you can see something, but you're contained in something at the same time. And so the lid is open on these, and the spirits are there nurturing, taking care of me, and healing me in this particular piece. So there are several pieces um, of works that's in the series that um, are self-portraits at the time. And it's really interesting because I'm working on this body of work, and then all of a sudden the work changes. And you can't really do anything about it. You just have to go with it and go with the change and then realize how all of these works later on come together in a single conversation. This is another piece um, of me when I felt, I was at a time when I felt very fractured, but I used the cone flower in this particular piece and the cone flower for me is a symbol of strength um, I put them together in groups. It's almost like um, a field of flowers. It's like a community of strength. And so I'm showing that even though at this point in time I'm fractured, I can still heal and come together. This is another piece that um, I did called Remembering, the idea of looking to the past um, for the future. Again, I'm using the color blue, and again, the color blue for me is a very healing color. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about patterns. So you see a lot of patterns in my work, and as an artist, you know, I talk about this body of work and other bodies of work that I've done have really talked about identity, particular spiritual identity. I believe that there's physical identity, there's spiritual identity, there's all different types of identity. And so I had to figure out how do I make the unseen seen? How do I make the invisible visible? So when I talk about the veilscape, which is that space between the waking world and the spirit world, what does that look like? How do I show that to the viewer? And so for me, pattern, texture, and color made sense. There's this push and pull that happens between those components. Um, it's very much like life. There are these ins and outs that happen. And so as you see the figure going in and out of these, these color fields and these patterns, and the, the pattern shows up on the skin, it masks the face at times, it references how we exist in that space, how we transition in and out of the, spirit, the spiritual space and the waking space. Another self-portrait, um, again, there's a symbol here that I use, which is the bowl that you see in this piece. And the bowl represents the wound. And this was um, one of the pieces that I did when my um, mom first passed away. And it was just that moment of contemplation, that um, moment of wanting to, to go back and be nurtured. And so again, you see the mask on the face, the very subtle mask. Sometimes the mask in the work is literal. Sometimes it's very figurative. Um, and in this case, it's, it's a suggestion of a mask. So I now want to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about some projects that um, I've participated in. So I've worked with um, Array, which is a not-for-profit organization, um, Ava DuVernay, and she created this project called LEAP, the Law Enforcement Accountability Project. And so during this whole time when I'm actually 
kind of working on this work, I'm still working on this project with Ava as well. And it was very difficult because it was a very um, heavy project. And so she chose, I, I want to say it was around 50 artists around the United States, um, culinary artists, visual artists, poets, writers, artists in all different fields, um, performance artists, and asked them to talk about particular cases where there was police brutality, where there was police misconduct. And so she reached out to me and she sent me three cases to choose from. And the case that I chose was um, a case that was in Bastrop, Texas, probably about three hours from where I live in Houston. And um, there was a woman who reached out to the police because her significant other was fighting with his son in their front yard. And the police came, the fight was pretty much over. They were talking to the police officer. She steps out of her door and she was killed within seconds. The policeman shot her with his own personal weapon. His, I think it was a, an AR-7 gun um, that was, that was not issue, it was not police issue. He was found not guilty. And when I did the research and looked through the court case, the judge blamed the son and the father, said they were partially at fault for this. And he was never held accountable for her murder. And so this, um, going through everything that I was going through on top of you know, taking on this project, it was a lot, but I felt that it was important because it could have been my mom, it could have been my sister, it could have been me, it could have been anyone that I know, and um, I felt like it was something that I needed to lend my voice to as an artist. So this is the piece, and it was called Blue is the Color We See Before We Die. And what I wanted to do, the objective for me in this piece was to walk the viewer through the story of this tragic murder that took place. And so I'm, this, I'm gonna kind of walk you through how I created this work so you can, I guess it will give you an understanding of how I create the pieces in the way that I do. So again, starting with the, um, the veilscape, I used the cone flower again to represent community strength. And I put three solid um, colors of blue there, which for me was kind of like a peek into the waking world. And I felt that it was important to bring, even though the focus of this project was to call attention to the officer because, you know, the the news, they were like, well, we don't want to talk about them. We don't want to call their name. And I feel like when you don't call their name, you're not holding them accountable. And that's what the project was about, was about holding the officer accountable for his actions. But I still felt that it was important to tell their stories. So I wanted to represent them in a way that African-American men are seen, most often than not with, with law enforcement. They're seen as shadows. There is no face, there is no humanity. And that's the way I depicted these two um, gentlemen there. So it looks as if they're talking, they could be in confrontation, or they could just be having a discussion. You don't know. And a lot of times when law enforcement shows aggression, a lot of times they don't know. So I didn't want it to be um, uh, just, I wanted to show that that there was a discussion, but not necessarily violence. So the lady that's depicted here was the lady who was murdered, Yvette Smith. And I chose to represent her face as an African mask, influenced by an African mask, because I wanted her to be a symbol for all women of color, um, particularly black women. So she became a symbol for us. And the poppy flower 
is strategically placed in the area where she was shot. Um, the flower, it's a red poppy flower, which is a symbol for, memori for um, memorial for death. And so I placed it there intentionally. And she's falling. You get an idea of the scale. It's actually probably one of the larger pieces that I made. But the officer's face is the only face that I wanted to be recognized in the portrait because I wanted you to see him. I wanted him to look exactly um, as I saw him, as you would see him. I used his name. Daniel Willis, and I went online and I actually found the Bastrop badge that they wear, and I used the actual badge to collage into the piece. The gun that you see that's the pattern is the gun that he used to shoot her, his own personal weapon. And it's also part of the um, pants of one of the men because they're targets. Black men tend to be targets. So I wanted to show these men as targets. The other important aspect was I had him unveiling himself with a police flag, but the flag is upside down and backwards to symbolize a system in distress. So that was intentional. And this is the, the finished piece. And if you look very closely, um, it's a lot easier to see in person, but the blue, the blue spots that you see are eye shapes, a nose shape, and it, it is patterned after the original um, mask that was worn by the Klan. So I wanted the viewer to be uncomfortable. I wanted you to see this through the mask of a Klan, and I wanted the viewer to be uncomfortable. To, to see this through a different lens. So that's how I, I walk my way through works and how I talk about um, you know, subjects that are important to me and things that I want to say in the way that I want to tell stories. So another project that um, I did was called The Gathering Space. And this was really new um, for me to be able to work on this scale and do a public piece. This was a mural that I did at uh, Rice University. And it was an outdoor meditation space. And I wanted to create a space where students could come together, where the community could come and be surrounded by art and meditate, talk, conversate after being locked away for so long. And it was just really refreshing to be able to um, kind of drive by being unknown and see people interact with the work. It's really big. It was, it was amazing to see this piece go up, um, to see the community interact with the piece, and to see the students interact also. So here are the stu here's some students, and we, we built a platform that um, took on the pattern of the wall so that they could actually sit in the veilscape and be a part of it. And so it's, it's really cool to see the students um, interact in that space. The next project is called Keepsakes. And so this is a project that I um, am working with uh, High Point Press in Minnesota. And this is about adultification. The idea that as children, um, children who aren't held sacred, who um, have to grow up too fast, who um, not all the time, I mean, parents don't all the time, you know, have control over how fast their children have to grow up. You know, I, I was, you know, five years old, I knew how to come home, unlock the door, lock the door back. I knew how to fix my food, you know, because my mom had to work. So just the idea of holding sacred our children, our little girls, so that they don't grow up too fast. And this is actually my sister, Karen. And it's really interesting because she was the boss of all of us. And she was the one that got me ready for school. She was the one that told me to sit down, stop talking, and all of that. Um, and so she was kind of like Mama Hen. And so I wanted to include her in this project. 
these are some of the other portraits um, that were done. These are all lithographs. So the, the dresses are actually uh, collierograph plates. And the, the portraits are um, lithographs. So this is me pinning up the dresses. Uh, those were drawings that I used to um, just kind of get the positioning as to where I wanted the little girls to be placed. This is me drawing on the litho plate. And all of my work is hand stitched. The hand stitching is very important. Um, I grew up with um, my grandmother was a quilt maker. Actually, my grandmother on my mom's side and my father's side. I spent um, time with my grandmother on my mom's side making quilts. But she would tell me stories. That was our story time. She would make quilts. She would tell me history of the, the clothes that we had cut up to make the quilts. She would tell me about her childhood when she was a little girl. So for me, she was piecing together or stitching together my history. She was stitching together who I was and who I was to become. And so it was natural for me to bring this element into my work as I told the stories or tell the stories of the women who I depict in my work. And this is actually me. So thinking, um, rethinking printmaking. So I include a lot of mediums in my work. I do a lot of layering. I, I love layering. I love putting together different printmaking processes. But most importantly, I feel like I'm a printmaker at heart because I think printmaking. And so this particular uh, project, I was, was actually inspired by Judy Chicago's work, um, The Dinner Party. And where I liked what she did, I liked the concept of what she did, I felt like it was very exclusive. It was very exclusive to me as a black woman. So I was like, how do I create a body of work um, in the same vein that she did, but be able to make it inclusive, more inclusive, rather. So this was really interesting because every time I asked somebody to participate, they would send me these filtered images. And I was like, I can't use that. I need you as you. And so then I said, well, come to the studio and let me photograph you. Well, that turned into a debacle because it was like, well, let me see. Let me, let's retake it. Wait, you didn't get my good side. So I just stopped asking altogether. So I was like, let's go hang out. And I would just snap pictures. And um, they never knew. So I never asked. And so I was just kind of hoping that once the um, project was complete, that they would be OK with it. <laughs> and most of them were, well, actually, all of them were. I, I haven't had anyone um, complain about being a part of this this project. But it was really interesting because I was wondering, like, what would it be like to be in a room with 300 women that have all touched me in some way? Women I've known for years, women that I knew for five minutes. Because, you know, sometimes you could say good morning to someone, and it mean the difference between a good day and a bad day. And there are women that have touched my life in just that way. And I included some of those women in this project. So there are 300 plates. Um, the only, they had to be white plates. Um, it was OK if they had small amounts of color or embellishments on the plates. That was fine. Um, so when I think about this, I think of it as a varied addition printmaking term. And I use the drawings done with litho crayon. So using printmaking tools, thinking about it in, in a printmaking train of thought. So how do I make it inclusive, more inclusive, even more inclusive than 300 women? I put an eight foot table with chairs and I want the viewer to have a seat to talk to think, to um, look at the women, to, um, to just be present in that moment with the work. And this is me and my son um, talking at one of the installations. I think this is at um, the Art League of Houston. And 
what I really like about this is every time the work is hung, it's always hung differently. So it's always like seeing it new for the first time. The only thing that I ask is that the work is not gridded and I ask that it cascades around the room. How you do that is up to you. I always like to give the curator the liberty of um, how they want to, to uh, see the work. This is another view. Here's a close-up view. This is Dr. Avia Wardlaw. She was one of my um, history professors at Texas Southern University. And so definitely a lady that has touched my life in, in a ton of ways. And last but not least, Black Box Press Foundation. So in the midst of all of this, um, you know, our political climate, I decided that um, my son and I had a conversation and we formed Black Box Press Foundation. And it was during the time of, you know, the political climate that we had, you know, with Trump, um, George Floyd, protests were everywhere. Um, people were being killed left and right. People were being brutalized. And I had a conversation with my 17-year-old son and, um, I got to understand him as a young black man and how he was navigating the space that he was in. And he got to understand me as his mother and not as that person that was nagging and hounding him to be careful and trying to keep up with him and trying to make sure, you know, he was safe. And we just had a we 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 had an understanding. So I created an image of him and um he suggested, after several inquiries about purchasing the piece, he suggested that we make prints and sell them. So I'm thinking, he wants some money. But he said to me, and I was so proud and just, just shocked, he says, let's make prints and donate the money. So we researched um, organizations, and we couldn't quite find what we were looking for, so we decided to be the change that we wanted to see. And there were so many artists at the time of these protests that were creating such incredible, profound art and was using their voice artistically that we decided to create a foundation that would fund artists, $5,000 unrestricted grants. We would connect those artists with institutions that would host their exhibitions and to date, we have funded four artists. Really excited and proud about that. And we've even incorporated some smaller micro grants of people. I mean, we've, we've just had such incredible people apply. It was like, let's just, you know, we gotta give them something. <laughs> so um, hopefully this will grow. I have no doubt that it will. But I'm hoping that one day it'll be international and we'll be able to um, connect artists with other artists in other spaces around the world. Um, these are the artists that we funded to date. Um, Nastasha Swift, um, Rashawn Rucker, um, Aaron Coleman, and David Clemens. Um, they've all received the grant and they're all going to um, be doing exhibitions. So the really interesting thing about this grant is that um, you, know, you have a whole year and the grant's unrestricted. So you set the date with the, the gallery. We connect everybody. We act as that middle person, and we check in during the year to say, hey, you know, is everything going OK? Is there anything else we could do? But we've been able to connect with some amazing, incredible institutions that have not only hosted our artists, but have met the fund, matched our funds as well. And so it's a really great opportunity, and we're hoping, again, to um, expand well beyond what we're doing now. As a part of that, um, I have established Black Box Press Residency, which is an invitational residency at this time. I've had two artists to come in. Um, this is Taniki Award, myself, and my studio assistant, um, Renee Smith. This is Chloe Alexander. She came in and she's a, oh, an amazing screen printer. 
And it was really interesting because they came in and I was like, you know, I opened my home to them and they were like, no, we want to stay in the studio. So I was like, what? And they were like, yeah. I was like, well, I have a bed in the studio, but are you sure? And so it's become this thing that they just stay in the studio <laughs> and work all night. So it's it's been wonderful having um, other artists come in and learn their process. And, you know, we talk shop all the time. This is Tanikia. Uh, working in the studio as well. This is my studio. Um, pretty excited to, um, I've added on a few additions to the studio. Um, I'm not going to add any more. This is probably it. <laughs> um, so this is um, just some shots from the studio the press that you see in the back that um i'm very proud of that press that's a, a custom press to actually fit my larger prints i call her big mama um we actually built the studio around her so there's a brick foundation underneath the studio to hold her up and i was pretty nervous my brother brought his uh forklift and sat it in and i was on pins and needles and he's like be quiet i got this so um, here is the press room before we put everything in. Um, it doesn't look like that now. I decided I'd show you the nice, clean view. Uh, this is the um, letterpress space, sort of. That's my security, um, laying next to Big Mama, protecting her. I like to relax. I like to, to make sure that I'm able to have some downtime in the studio, so patio. Um, letterpress studio, so in the studio we have lithography, we have etching, we have letterpress, we have silk screen. Um, I recently added a potter's wheel because I have visions of printing on clay, and no, I do not know how to do that right now. But, um, you know, I'm a visionary and I love thinking about more processes and more things that I can do in the studio. I love being able to walk in a space where I can make the impossible possible and hoping to share that with other artists as well. So this is what the studio looks like when I'm working. It's a hot mess. Um, these are some of the pieces that were in Conjure. And we have a studio garden. And that's what it looks like in the summertime. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, no? Yes. Thank you. So I noticed uh, there's a lot of circles yes, yes. in your work. Do those have any significance? Yes. The circle represents the moon, and the moon is a symbol for the female. There's always a feminine presence in my work, whether it's an image of a male or a female. <coughs> the women wear hoop earrings. When I was six months old, my ears were pierced. I've been wearing hoops since I was six months old. The little girls that are born in my family, their ears are pierced very early and they all wear gold hoops. And so for me, that became um, kind of a symbol of you being initiated or brought into the fold of womanhood um, of this family of women. Yes. The piece that you did for Lee, how big is that? It's around 12 feet and width and at least 8 or 9 feet high. Is it the biggest thing you've ever done? No. Really? What's <laughs> the biggest thing you've ever done? Um, uh, well, not the mural. It was actually a piece on paper. I love working on paper. Um, I think that piece was about 15 in uh, width and 10 in height. Very big. Anyone else? Yes. One thing I've never noticed before, looking at all the pieces, like the, the expressions in the women's faces, 
I don't, I don't want to use a, a I want to say like complacent or just like sort of like neutral. But what is the, so is there like an intention to sort of make them like not smiling or not frowning or? Actually, no. Um, I never ask them not to smile. I never ask them. That's just what I get. It's weird. I, I don't know. Yes. Um, what kind of feedback did you get on this piece from the community? I mean, where was this shown? Was this taken into the community? Yes. Of that police officer? Yeah. Yes. It was originally shown, um, it made its debut on Good Morning America with Ava DuVernay, and it was um, placed at the um, African American Museum in Houston. It is on a 14 city or 12 city tour. Uh, the second stop has been, um, it's in Alabama currently at the uh, Justice Center. And what kind of um, feedback or pushback did you get from this police officer or you know, I guess I want to say the other side. Honestly, I've gotten no pushback at all. Uh, that's amazing. To me, it seems like the, uh, you talked about the blue circles as the hood, but I immediately thought that what he was pulling off was a, you know, a Ku Klux Klan hood. Did you, is that what he's pulling that thing off? It seems like he's, he's, he's unveiling himself of the police flag the idea of some, something that they hide behind. You're hiding behind this police law enforcement flag, you know, police, you know, blue lives matter. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? No? Yes. You mentioned certain colors have like symbols and whatnot, mm -hmm. but they're, just looking at this, there's so many colors in there. How do you choose your color beyond like, this is a symbol for, for that? Um, so I work in layers and every layer dictates what happens next. So um, if I'm working from the perspective of a color, um, I start with that color and then from there it just builds. And I guess over the years, I've, I feel like I'm like the um, the live version of Photoshop. <laughs> so I've learned to turn it off and turn it back on because I don't know how the figure's gonna lay on top of the pattern or the color, how what color's gonna react to the other color. Um, again, I try and work as intuitively as possible so um, it's not intentional or, you know, it just kinda happens. Inks or these oil paints on these large? Both. It's acrylic paints and um, oil-based ink. Charcoal, acrylic paint, oil-based ink, um, and I think Prismacolor, just whatever I have. Yes. So working with your layers, did you have a preference for a technique to start with, or is it whatever? Um, whatever. I mean, sometimes I'll do um, an oil-based layer. Um, most of the, the solid colored layers are acrylic because I need it to dry really fast because I'm impatient. And I use um, cobalt dryer in my ink because I like to work. I don't want to wait. Um, Um, Intaglio ink will fire to cone six or eight. I'm sorry? sorry. Will fire to cone six or eight. So when you're doing your um, your ceramics with her making, you can fire that like pretty high in the dirt. I have no idea what yeah. you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what you said, but I'm going to write it down. <laughs> Actually, I'm um, going to be working with um, Hummingbird Press. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So I'm going to be working with Hummingbird Press at um, Penland next summer. And so we're hoping to kind of collaborate on a project. But yeah, I have no clue. I have all the supplies. I just have no clue what to do with them. 
Um, my question was, like, I'm, I'm really enjoying both of your series of work that are, like, um, reflective and have real age your family, but I think that the work that is social political is so timely, so I'm curious about, like, where, what you want to do next. You know, I don't know. This was actually my first real introduction into that area. So not only did um, I feel like I needed to say something, I felt like it was important to continue to challenge myself and evolve as an artist. So I'd never worked on a mural that big. I'd never um, done a project like I did with Ava. So I'm hoping to have more, but I don't, I'm open to whatever comes next, but um, I always get excited about things I've never tried. So I'm always trying to, if someone comes to me with a new project, if I'm swamped, I'm gonna be like, okay, I'll figure it out, but I wanna do it. You have some work going to Italy. Yes. Can you tell us what the theme is? Yes. So um, I have work going to the Venice Biennale and I'm really excited about that. So a uh, group, my gallery was invited to participate. She chose seven artists to um, participate in the exhibition and she asked us to think about Afrofuturism and she asked each artist to interpret that. So my interpretation of Afrofuturism was as a black woman creating a space whether it's past, present, or future, whether it's um, a psychological space or a physical space, creating a space in which the black body lives, exists, and thrives. And so um, that's what I, I did with my work. And so they're monitoring? So they're yes. Okay. Yes. Um, when you're working this large scale, how many additions do you know? I don't addition unless I'm doing a project that requires additioning. Um, I do work in varied additions, and those works are like, um, the smallest I'll work in that size is like 22 by 30, and it's generally not more than 10. Yes. I have a really technical question for <laughs> you. Yes. So when you're drawing in charcoal over a layer of acrylic paint, do you have to put down any kind of ground that would grip the charcoal more, or do you just draw right on the acrylic? I just draw on it. And um, I seal it afterwards sometimes. Um, what I found really interesting, like working on the plates, those were just plates that I found like at Goodwill or plates that were donated. Working with the litho crayon, the longer the crayon stayed on the plate, it stayed on the plate. So I had a window of time in which to, I could just smudge it out. But let's say after 24 hours, it was there to stay. And I don't understand the chemistry of how that worked, but yeah, but no, I, I don't. Um, but I will tell you this, um, depending on the color that I use, depends on how it takes the charcoal. So it's always different depending on the color. And I think that has something to do with the binder that's in it. Anyone else? Nope. Well, thank you so much.